coming out tonight. It's a bit of a, a bold title, isn't it, this? Um, Russia's foreign policy revealed in Bible prophecy. How could it possibly be that there's something written in this, in this very ancient book which links in with the, the present policy of the uh, country of Russia um, well, we hope to take a look at that and try and convince you that, that there is an important Bible prophecy dealing with the nation of Russia. Now, I just want to take you back, first of all, to um, a, a magazine. This is the very earliest magazine of Christadelphians called Herald of the Kingdom, volume 1, number 11, 1851. So we're going back an awful long time. And the editor of that magazine was a man by the name of John Thomas, a medical doctor. And he published an article by a, a reverend from New York. And I just want to give you the, a few sentences from the opening paragraph of that article. And remember that at the time, Russia was under the rule of the Tsars. So this is what he says. Present aspect of Russia is a title. And this is what he says. Russia, with an ambition that knows no bounds, with resources almost inexhaustible, and secret policy intriguing at every court in Europe, seeks to extend her territory over all of Central Asia and to outvie ancient Rome in the extent of her dominions and in the majesty of her power. Now, why was this article published why was it written why was it published it's because it has to do with bible prophecy and, and the position really of russia's foreign policy hasn't changed that much it is one of expansion and we just want to explore that this evening and we're going to look at the ways in which the uh, former soviet states are starting to be um, influenced more by, by Russia. And we're going to do that with the help of a, a, a book which um, I will recommend to you in, in a few minutes. It's the original emblem of the Soviet republics. And you'll notice that um, there are bands here in, in writing, which there's no way we can understand, um, that there are six of them. And that's because the Soviet republics um, started off with six, just six republics. Now, does anybody know when that started? What was the date of that? And that The date was the 30th of December, 1922. So, a little bit more now as far as questions are concerned. Now, you'll notice that's different. So, what do you think that could represent? But specifically, again, it's the very last emblem of the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was disbanded on 26th of December 1991, so it nearly lasted 69 years, all but a few days. So now what we're going to see now is a map. And this is a map of the former Soviet republics, except the names aren't there. And all those became independent republics after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. And what we're going to see is the way in which Russia has been moving, certainly since 2000, and the key to that date, 2000, was when Vladimir Putin took control. Um, you can see the way in which these former Soviet republics are being influenced in various ways, in various means, so that there can be a recreation of the Russian Empire. And we're going to see that that's got something to do with, with Bible prophecy. Now, in addition to this, just as an aside, there was also, of course, the loss of the Eastern European bloc countries. And we've just listed there. So, so Russia really went through a pretty bad time uh, leading up to the collapse of the Soviet Union and when the Soviet Union collapsed. And up until the, the 2000, when Putin started to come to power and, and, and start to rebuild and take control, it went through a pretty tough time losing its its influence. Now, where does the Bible come in to all this? Well, there is a prophecy in the Bible, which I'm going to ask you to turn to now, which is in Ezekiel 38, which you may well have guessed, which seems to be a very pivotal prophecy for the latter days. Now, we believe that this phrase, the latter days, 
is so important. It's very important because <clears throat> we believe that the circumstances of this prophecy that we're going to briefly look at are happening in our own times. That those circumstances were not in existence in 1851 when that article was, was published in that Christadelphian magazine. But now they are almost fulfilled. And so we need to have a look at some of these things. And the first thing we want to look at, it's two primary headings that we're going to look at. The first one is this, the alignment of nations undergo. Well, what's all this about? Well, if you look at chapter 38 and you look at the very beginning of that, you can see that there's a prophecy directed. So it's the word of God being directed against Gog. Now, Gog is addressed here. And it says it's of the land of Magog, and I'm reading from the King James Version, but you may find that you've got a more up-to-date version, which changes what I'm going to read as the chief prince to Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And Rosh is a name by which Russia was known many, many years ago. So we've got I, to identify these nations, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, and then there are other nations mentioned in chapter and verse 5 of the same chapter Persia Ethiopia Libya other nations again Goma to Gama but you can see that there's a geographical identification also which helps us and it says they are of the north quarters and and this invasion which is spoken about in this chapter is to come from the north so there's verse 1 and verse 15 if we can just maybe turn over and have a look at verse 15 still addressing this <coughs> this power called Gog and thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts thou and many people with thee all of them riding upon horses a great company and a mighty army now where are they going to go to they are going to go verse 8 tells us against the mountains of Israel which have always been waste. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because we can look back in fairly recent history and realize that up until the middle of the last century, that was the situation in the land of Israel, known then as, as Palestine, that it was a pretty desolate place with malaria swamps, with deserts and so on. And it's not like that at all today. So things have, have changed. This prophecy has, is directing a, 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 at a time when that situation of it being waste is no longer in existence. So that really helps us to identify and pinpoint the time when this prophecy is going to come to pass. And another thing that helps us also in verse 8 and in verse 16, it is to take place after many days in the latter years or in the latter days and those phrases will be found in verses 8 and verse 16 so when Ezekiel wrote this it's about 500 years uh, nearly 600 years before Christ so that's 2500 600 years ago and and so it's one of these prophecies in the Bible that that takes us right right to the end times we believe um, there are a lot of prophecies that don't do that, but this one certainly does. It projects us right into a time period which we can identify as, as our own. So for that reason, it's pretty pivotal really, isn't it? Because if it is telling us about a, an invasion that is to take place on the land of Israel, and if we to go on in reading this prophecy and in the next chapter, you'll see that there is a, an intervention that is going to take place. And that is going to be by the Lord Jesus Christ who will have returned to the earth for that purpose. That he might save his people. And then that's the next bit, the important bit of this spiritual prophecy. What about this nation, this state of Israel? Where is this invasion going to take place? Well, it's going to take place, and as verse 8 says, on the mountains of Israel. 
It's going to take place on a people that were gathered out of nations and now dwell in the midst of the land. And that's another feature whereby we can identify that this is a prophecy for our times. Because it's only in recent times, isn't it, that the Jews have gone back to the land. And in particular, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there have been a lot of Jews that have emigrated from Russia and some of the former Soviet states to Israel. And we're going to come back to that point shortly. So they're going to dwell in the midst of the land, and this invasion is specific that this power, which we believe to be led by Russia, who we believe is the, is the Gog of Ezekiel 38, with all these other nations, is to come against my people Israel, and it will be as a cloud to cover the land. Now, the prophecy also requires something else, which isn't quite in place yet. It requires that Israel is to be at rest from all her enemies and dwelling without walls, bars and gates. Now we do know that there are things that have happened in recent times. We know that there's been a peace treaty with Egypt and then a peace treaty with Jordan. And then the civil war in Syria, which has brought Russia into play, has meant that the northern border of Israel on the Syrian side that, that area there is, is secure. The, the Israelis feel quite happy about that. So there's the area of Lebanon, there's the Hezbollah, there's also the Palestinians. And so things are not quite in place where we can say absolutely that they are dwelling without walls, um, without bars and gates. And, and that's important for us to understand the prophecy because they do not expect this invasion to take place. It's pretty clear from when you read Ezekiel 38 that they do not expect it to happen at all. Now, the next slide I'm going to just suggest to you where some of these nations in old times, in Ezekiel's day, where they were, where they were located geographically. And I know there are slight differences in, in where that might be, but I'm going to give you what I think is the the answer to this and we'll, we'll just see one of the things about bible prophecies we can't be absolutely certain about every single detail precisely but this is what i think we are being told and we are being directed to so just quickly some of these nations i haven't put them all on tagama is is in here this is where that nation was located before the southern russian state russia russian states or the soviet states around this area Rosh, of course, goes right up to, to Russia. Libya is mentioned in this prophecy as well, and it's over to North Africa. Kush, or um, uh, it's, it's mentioned at Ethiopia, but the, the word is Kush, and it refers to the area of southern Egypt, the uh, Nubian peoples that, that were there at the time. And then Persia is the old name for Iran. There's also a reference to the king of the north. Now, you won't find that, in this prophecy, but you'll find it at the end of a very long prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, <coughs> from verses 40 to 45, and you'll find there a reference to the king of the north, and the territory of the king of the north is north of Israel, and that's where Russia is at the moment, and that's where we've got the Russian flags, because they've got two bases there, a naval base and an air base, and their military base is, is there also. So, what do we know so far then? We, we know that... Um, Gog is prince of um, Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Possibly Meshach refers to Moscow, Tubal, to the river Tobol, which is in Siberia. Um, we know that Russia has, is uh, present in Syria. We know that there is a relationship that Russia has with Iran and with Turkey. In fact, they quite often get together as a threesome and discuss issues. Um, they are allied Russia is allied with Sudan and with Libya, and um, it's seeking control, and this is where we're going to go in a minute, it's seeking control and influence over the former uh, Soviet states. Now, I came across this book um, and uh, some articles or some posts by the writer of this book, and 
I decided to, to buy it and found it absolutely fascinating because what it does is it tells us about Russia's uh, movements at the moment, particularly over the former Soviet states. And there are seven stages in this is book. Is, it's called Beyond Crimea, the New Russian Empire. And what it identifies is certain strategies and stages by which Russia is seeking influence over the former Soviet states, that it might bring them back under its control. And we're going to see something which is in all of these stages, which is, which is common almost to all of them, and that's going to be very relevant to what we are going to look at later regarding this invasion. So, this could take a while, so I'm going to go quite fast now and just go through these seven points very, very quickly. So, the first one is soft power. Now, what soft power is, it's a state's ability to wield its influence and culture and political values and foreign policies. A lot of states do this kind of thing, and it has to be something that's done uh, where people are drawn to it rather than it being forced upon them. And the examples that come forward in the media, cultural figures, universities and the church. And, and Russia's been very active in this because it set up that organisation there which is no way I don't think any of us will be able to understand what that is. So here's the English version, which doesn't help an awful lot. Ruski Mir Foundation. Now, Mir is the Russian word for world, so it's the Russian World Foundation. This was set up by President Putin in 2007. And notice one thing about it particularly, that it is there to promote the Russian language. Now, this is the thing that I think you will find common to all of these stages. And as far as those... 14 republics are concerned, the Russian influence has not gone all the way in many of them. It's gone all the way in one particular part, but it hasn't gone through all those stages in all of these different republics, but it's gone so far. So we, we can see that this is something that Russia is seeking to do. Now, it's got um, soft power in the Central Asian states of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan has been very successful owing to, again, what we find is the prevalence of the Russian language, the presence of the Russian Orthodox Church, and Russian economic influence and nostalgia for the Soviet era, which apparently still, still exists. So that's a very um, early stages of Russian influence. And they're doing their utmost to try to uh, bring that forward. Another thing that they uh, consider, is next point, is humanitarian policies. And, and so the growing trend that there is in the world towards human rights, Russia has seized upon this and says, well, if it's good enough for the West, it's good enough for us. So we can use this now to exert our influence. And of course, what they're wanting to do is to influence those Russians that have uh, migrated during the Soviet era to various <coughs> states that they were, and the spread of the Russian language. And this uh, country here, Moldova, um, has long had this area here since, I think, 1990, Transnistria, which is an area where there are Russian troops. It's not a, recognized as a republic, not even by Russia, but it's a separatist area of Moldova. And you're going to see that there's more of these as we progress. So, employing a tactic like this, what Russia is able to do, if it's saying, look, we want to sort out the human rights in one of these um, countries that used to belong to the Soviet Union, um, it's diverting attention, first of all, from its own record, which is not particularly brilliant in human rights. Uh, it can questions the scope by which governments can protect minorities, and so it would discredit the governments. If they have Russians living in a particular area, and those Russians are not treated well, then the Russian, can, the Russian government, Moscow, can, can criticise that country, and, and it's, it discredits it, that they're not able to protect their minorities. Using... Uh, uh, arguments such as legitimacy, justice and national interests where its actions are not supported by international law and what it also does is it provides financial assistance. So it pours money into Transnistria, for example, that it might keep that area 
part of Moldova, recognized internationally, but Russia wants to keep part of that separate. And we'll see that that comes out um, in one or two of the other things that we want to look at. Now, we want to move on to the next one. And before I show you this slide, there are words, so some Russian words, we've seen some already, but there are some other Russian words which I'm not going to even attempt to, to pronounce. So, that's the Russian word for the compatriot policies. And Russia has a, has a wide view of who are Russian compatriots. Uh, anyone in the Russian diaspora residing outside the Russian Federation, ethnic Russians residing in the former states of the Soviet Union, uh, and Russian speakers who may be of various nationalities. And what uh, we've done here is uh, they have set up another um, uh, organization or agency by which they can um, look after the compatriots living abroad, which was created in September 2008. So the other organization, 2007, here's another one, 2008. And next we can see that R Moscow um, is guilty of manipulating its compatriots sometimes as a tool of influence. Um, they might not want to be influenced, but Russia uses them, uses their presence to influence for its own benefit. This next one is very interesting. We, it's called passportization, and Russia's been dishing out passports, Russian passports, very, very regularly to all sorts of people. And we're going to look at it in, in terms here of the, the Baltic states, which gives us some um, idea. First of all, the Baltic states are a big problem for Russia in that they have joined the European Union, they have joined NATO. And so they were quick off the ball, and Russia was not quick enough to do anything about that sort of situation. But it doesn't want to expand things any further. But what that has done is it's created a situation where in these Baltic states there were Russians who were um, living there in the Soviet era and when the Soviet Union collapsed of course they needed to have a nationality their nationality is Russian but they weren't living in Russia they were living in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania but because they were ethnic Russians the Estonians etc didn't give them recognition, so they cannot get an, a, an Estonian passport or a Latvian passport and so on. So they, they're non-citizens, as it were. So Russia stepped in, giving them Russian passports in, in those situations. And, and this, this um, tactic has, has been employed in other areas. Next, we go, I'm trying to get through these fairly quickly now, We're, uh, we've only got three more to go. Information warfare, the le leading up to military conflict. So Russia is obviously stepping things up as, as it progresses. And, and what we find here is that it has got an issue at eastern Ukraine. If we look at this map, first of all, you can see that over this area here, eastern Ukraine, and the darker the blue, the more Russian speakers there are. And, and, and so this idea of the Russian language comes very much to the fore once again. And there are some in this area, separatists from Ukraine. This is all Ukraine here. And the, what, that Russia has... Um, there, the, that there are so many Russian citizens, and, and many of them in that particular area want to be more allied with Russia but yes this is but this is Ukrainian sovereign territory so what they do is they they step up their efforts with Russian propaganda closing down Ukrainian television stations and 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 having Russian television stations uh, and so it is a way of moving the Russian policy forward and remember what Russian policy is it's expansion now, there's a domino effect in all of this because what happens then as a result of that is that Ukraine now is an unstable republic. It's unstable because there's a large area here, particularly in this area here, where there was war, where there are Russian troops, where there are separatists. And as a result of that, any ambition that Ukraine might have had to join NATO or might have had to join the European Union has really been very much put on the back burner because neither the European Union nor NATO want to accept a country where there are uh, 
pretty serious conflicts within the country's borders. Next, there is protection, Russian propaganda about the mistreatment of compatriots is often brought to the fore as a means by which Russian troops can be sent in to regions as peacekeepers. And, and that action happened in Georgia in 2008 with two particular parts of Georgia which have now declared themselves as separate republics. We'll see the map in a minute. But the Russian Foreign Secretary, Sergei Lavrov, um, is saying that um, I'm afraid we can't help ourselves. We've got to go out and help our Russian compatriots if they're not being treated well, because that's in our constitution. So it's unavoidable. And um, these two territories here in, um, in the state of Georgia, which is this, all this area here is Georgia, but these two areas that I've put these squares around, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, have declared themselves separate republics. They're not part, they are part of Georgia internationally, but they've declared themselves as separate republics um, and they have um, links, clear links with Russia. And it is expected that in South Ossetia here, North Ossetia, which is just there, quite likely might amalgamate at some time in the future. So you can see that the, the former um, Soviet states are being influenced quite dramatically by, by Russia in many ways. And the final stage is that of annexation. And that, of course, took place in Crimea. And Crimea is part of Ukraine, but it's the only part so far that Russia has completely annexed to itself. And what is interesting about that particularly is this. Um, that when the R Russian forces went in, they went in without any um, identification that they were Russians. And so Putin was able to say they're not Russian forces in Crimea. But of course everybody knows that they were. And now Crimea is regarded completely as part of <coughs> Russia. So that's what Russia is working towards. And I picked up this slide, which is interesting, based on the game of Monopoly. Oh, the other thing about Crimea was, by the way, virtually all Russian speaking in Crimea. So the Russian language again comes to the fore. So here's a, um, a, a Monopoly board, passing go, and then these are the places we've looked at already, uh, Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Crimea. And the question is, well, what next? And then we go to the Old Kent Road, Kazakhstan, and so on, and work your way around. And, and, and you can see that these, um, these ones in red here are the, the Russian speakers, the percentage of the population that speak Russian. Now, there is um, an interesting um, verse in Ezekiel 38. If we can go back there for a minute and see in verse 7, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. That's exactly what Russia has been trying to do, to be a guard unto them. Now, there's another piece of information that I found um, very, very useful. Um, it's just, a, again, you can get this if you are interested. It's about 20 pages off the internet. It's headed up, um, Moscow on the Mediterranean, Russia and Israel's relationship. So now we're getting more to think a little bit about the uh, prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38. This has been prepared by the Foreign Policy Research Institute, which is something from the United States. And um, I just want to read a couple of paragraphs from, from that. So here's the first one. The ties between Russia and Israel have evolved as both states develop their individual post-Cold War strategic views and policies. The steady progress that has been made since the restoration of diplomatic relations in 1991, and particularly since Vladimir Putin assumed office in 2000, represents a significant improvement in Israel's national security environment and an important gain for Russia's global and regional policy. Bilateral relations are the best they have been since 1991 and perhaps ever. So what that's telling us is, in, in this pretty highbrow assessment of foreign policy relations, that Russia and Israel are very much coming together in cooperation, in trade, in other things. So since Russia's 
2015 intervention in Syria, each slide sees the other as a major player in the region with the capacity to affect its national security interests. The interests of the two states are only rarely identical, but are often in sync. Even in cases where they are opposed, both sides recognise the importance of the other and make significant efforts to de-conflict. Well, there is more. I'm going to spare you some of that at the moment. And we're going to ask some questions. But I say, if you want to, to read that for yourself, it's, it's a very, very interesting um, little few pages to read, about 20 pages. Um, and it's quite eye-opening to see the way in which Israel and Russia are coming together. Now, that's quite significant because what we are expecting from this prophecy is the next phase for Israel to be at rest. Now, what would cause Israel to be at rest? Well, there are two things, I think. One could be that somebody becomes a guarantor for peace in the region. Certain things that have happened from the, in the United States recently, the uh, recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel by the United States, the moving of its embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, and other comments that have been made, like recognizing the Golan Heights as part of Israel and so on by America, has kind of ruled them out. Ruled them out as being somebody whom the Arab nations, the Palestinians in particular, would be willing to work with to guarantee peace in the region. But that's where Russia has kind of stepped in. And this is very, very interesting because the other thing that needs to be resolved for Israel to be at rest is some kind of stability over the Palestinian problem that exists at the moment. But how is that kind of going to happen when... Russia guaranteeing peace for Israel when we are suggesting to you that Ezekiel 38 is telling us about a Russian invasion of Israel. Well, I hope from what you saw with those ways in which Russia works with its former Soviet states, that it doesn't actually always work in an open capacity. But it very much works behind the scenes, influencing and so on. And, and I suggest to you that this is the kind of thing we could probably expect in order for this prophecy to be fulfilled. Now, what could cause Russia to come down and invade Israel? What would be the reasons? Well, first of all, we saw that Israel would be invaded at a time when it didn't expect to be invaded, when its guard was let down. And so if Russia is the guarantor of peace in the area then it will not be perceived as a threat. This threat is going, to, is going to come because it tells us in verse 10 of Ezekiel 38, Thus saith the Lord God, it shall come to pass, also come to pass, that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil, to take a prey. Now Israel is a more prosperous country than one would have ever thought it would have been. That's one thing. But there's perhaps a little bit more to it than that. I hope that you notice, because I tried to emphasize the importance of the Russian language as an influence for Russia to move into the former Soviet states. That was the main thing, that these are Russians. And if they're Russians, then we will try to protect the Russians. That's what the policy of Russia is. And it is interesting that there are now 1.5 million Russian Jews who are living in Israel, who have emigrated in the post Soviet era and many of these are very clever people and many of these have contributed to the prosperity of the state of Israel knowing what we know about how Russia has worked with the former Soviet states from what we've briefly looked at and what we can discover in more detail if we want to try to find out about it you can see that one of the goals on Putin's hidden agenda might well be that he wants to bring these people back. He wants to go and get them back into Russia. Now that agrees with Bible prophecy in 
uh, Zechariah chapter 14. If we just take a quick look at this. Now this is a prophecy of the same time. The same time of the invasion of Ezekiel 38. We've got an invasion of the land spoken about by the prophet Zechariah in chapter 14. And what he says here, um, I will just look at verse 2. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women rubbished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, although that's speaking specifically about Jerusalem, it might well be Jerusalem as a representative of the nation itself and you can see that half of them are going to go into captivity this is prior to the return to the earth of the lord jesus christ to save his people and 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 so it's not beyond the powers of uh, our imagination to think that that could well be one reason another possible reason might be that he might be able to say he needs to defend the cause of the Palestinians if Israel annexes the West Bank and recently there have been suggestions that Israel want to do something in that area which I'll show you in a minute you see allies <coughs> that Russia has it's not just um, with Israel but it also is friendly to Iran and Syria <coughs> and some other Arab countries and somehow or other it is maintaining a relationship with all of these countries who are sworn enemies with each other it's something that that America was not able to do and so it's putting itself in a very very good position to be the one who is to fulfill the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 now I'm not going to look at all this in any detail but very recently this month Netanyahu in a meeting that took place in Lisbon uh, with the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo suggested um, that I want US recognition for our sovereignty over the Jordan Valley and so on and so the record and the, the, the report goes on to explain that's what they want so it could be that at some point Russia thinks having sorted out the peace well Israel now has gone a bit too far and we need to try to satisfy our other allies. Big power in the region is Iran. And we need to do something, therefore, about the Palestinian problems. Another thing, this came out in September, is this. That Russia considers that Israel is a Russian-speaking nation. Vladimir Putin said. He made the statement his strongest public expression of kinship with the Jewish state to date during a speech Tuesday, so sometime mid-September, in Moscow, at an event organised by the United Israel Appeal, a Zionist organisation responsible for collecting funds, and so on. I won't read all of that, but again, it's just illustrative of, of how these things could come to pass so easily. So, our final slide gives us just a bit of a summary of some of these things. So, we've already quoted uh, that. That's from Ezekiel chapter 38. And um, Israel is, doesn't seem to be so concerned now. The current uh, Prime Minister of Israel, who may not be the Prime Minister for much longer, um, is very often visiting Moscow. He, he goes there more often than he goes to America. And he's uh, definitely friendly terms with, with Putin. Um, so he's building closer ties with Russia. And that agrees with this requirement of the prophecy that Israel must dwell safely and are at rest. Russia has a naval, air and land bases existing in Syria and these are expanding and that agrees with the prophecy in Daniel chapter 11 which we haven't had time to turn to where it speaks about the king of the north coming down, same, same invasion, same time, like a whirlwind with many ships. And so there's a Russian base just in the Mediterranean north of Lebanon um, in Syria where it is in Russian hands and it will be in Russian hands for 49 years with an opportunity then to extend the lease for 25 years it's been given to Russia for the way in which they've helped support the Assad regime in, uh, Assad regime in Syria and then that final point there there are 1.5 million Russian 
um, speaking Israelis. And this is what we have just looked at in Zechariah chapter 14. So it isn't quite such a fantastic thing, is it, to say that the Bible speaks about Russian foreign policy. It, it does. It clearly does in Ezekiel chapter 38 and these other prophecies that can be allied with it. We speculate a bit about just the, what the reasons might be for these things to happen. But the way in which Putin could come down to get his Russians back fits in with the pattern that we see in the way in which Russia is operating with the former Soviet states. And President Putin will end his term of office in 2024. And as far as I know from the Constitution, unless he changes it, um, that will be the end of his presidency over the um, Russian uh, nation. Interesting, isn't it? Because that might be an indicator, it might just be an indicator that things that will be the final chapters in Ezekiel 38, the final bits of that prophecy, might be very soon coming to pass. That means we need to give great attention to those things that are in the Word of God. Because in the Word of God, there is a tremendous offer for us to escape all of these problems that are coming on the earth. And to be allied with the Lord Jesus Christ when he defends his people and when he saves his people and when he then, then, he, then, when he then sets up the kingdom of God on earth, sitting on the throne of his father David, which was a promise that the angel Gabriel gave to his mother before he was born. These things are vital. These things are important. It's worth us looking at them. It's worth us thinking deeply about them. And it's worth us acting upon them. Thanks for listening.